Well, good evening and welcome to a special episode of The Help Desk. The Help Desk is a show here at First United Methodist Church of Lawrenceville that's really designed to have conversations around important and meaningful things happening in our community that can be helpful to each and every one of you. My name is Adam Hildebrandt and I, I get to be the senior pastor at First Methodist, but also get to be the host for this evening and just uh, enjoy some conversation with two really special uh, guys in our community, uh, uh, Chief Wallace and Mayor Still, and, and we're going to be talking about all of the things that are happening in our community and in our world right now, and uh, just getting some perspective on on what our city, what our police department, and uh, and what they're doing to uh, to begin conversations about moving forward uh, together as a community. And so, uh, just an honor and a privilege to have both of you guys with us today, uh, Chief Wallace. Why don't you go ahead and uh, tell us a little bit about yourself and how you ended up in public service? Well, I grew up in Snellville. Uh, my family moved there in 1973, so we went to Mount Zion Baptist Church, so we kind of had a little bit of a Lawrenceville and Snellville draw from both communities with it being in between mm -hmm. um, back when 124 wasn't quite as busy. Um, after graduating from South Gwinnett High School, I went down to Georgia Southern. I was down there for five years. We won three national championships in the span of those years. Um, went from 5,600 students to almost 13,000. Um, shortly after graduating with a Bachelor of Science in Criminal Justice, I came to Gwinnett County Sheriff's Department and began working there. Uh, spent five and a half years there, then came to the City of Lawrenceville Police Department in 1996. Um, spent a good part of my career as a motor cop and uh, supervising the motor unit, um, was promoted to sergeant in 2002, um, lieutenant in 2006, captain in 2011, and then I was appointed chief in April of 2018. Hmm. And on a cool. side note, almost a quarter century after graduating from college, I went back and got my master's degree at Columbus State University. So it was kind of a weird thing to walk in and have the professor on the first day say, on Thursday, I want a 10-page research paper done in APA style on comparisons of leadership versus management. And I turned around and looked and like, what did he just say? So I was like, yeah, yeah okay. Because we didn't have all that when I graduated from college in 1990. So a little <laughs> well, bit different. Congratulations on that. That's awesome. Yes. And uh, we, we appreciate all your work in the community. Uh, Mayor Still, great to uh, have you with us. Why don't you just tell us a little bit about yourself and uh, how you got involved in uh, public service? Well, um, I'll see if I try to parallel how the chief did it. I uh, I graduated from Central Gwinnett, so instead of South, so we were uh, we were rivals back in back in the day. Um, I uh, uh, went to University of Georgia. Um, my our team only won one national championship, and that was with Herschel. So, uh, <laughs> but I was there. Just hand him the ball. Just hand him the ball. <laughs> we had the same coach in Irk Russell, though. There you go. We did. We yes. did. Um, came came home and worked at the uh, family newspaper. My dad and I eventually owned together. Um, sold that in 1994. And had always been involved with the community during that time period and continued so forth through um, uh, starting another business and uh, mergers and acquisitions. And then I read a book called um, Toxic Charity by Bob Lupton. And uh, in, at that time, uh, Vicki and I had been like, uh, I like to say, like the, uh, the, the Israelites, we had uh, gone wandering for 20 years near to Kula. And uh, so we moved back to Lawrenceville because Bob's book said, if you want to change a community, you have to live in it. So we, um, we moved back and... Uh, and, and, and ended up, uh, you know, being encouraged to be on city council and then encouraged to be mayor. Um, and there, and so here I am. Uh, I never, <laughs> never intended to uh, really to, to be in politics. The last time I can tell you I ever thought about it was at age 17. And uh, somebody said, you, why don't you run, you know, try to be president of the United States? I said, sure. So that was the class I ever got. So. There you go. There you go. Well, uh, it's, it's been an interesting six months since you took office, and so uh, we, we can get into that a little bit, but you, you've, you've 
busy and 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 I, I you know I think I, maybe getting having the chance to get to know you in the last year and a half uh, j just such a calm presence in the midst of all of these storms so I appreciate you uh, and appreciate Chief Wallace and, and everything that you all mean to this city and uh, so I wanted to get that out of the way now, now all the pleasantries are done we can kind of talk uh, have some real talk um, last week there were were protests here in the city of Lawrenceville. Uh, you know, lots of, of angst and frustration and hurt over uh, some deaths in the African American community uh, around our world and just in, in terrible, terrible ways. These, these uh, senseless killings that took place in Brunswick and um, Minneapolis, you know, just lots of different things all came together in this one moment. So, uh, Chief Wallace, talk me through last week and, and what uh, maybe what you told your officers and maybe how you guys looked at handling the situation in a positive way. Well, it initially started Saturday afternoon. Um, the county had a large protest up in, around Discover Mills area, um, Sugarloaf. Um, we had sent some officers to help them. The roads were being shut down. I think everyone in the country was seeing what was happening in Minneapolis, New York, Atlanta, some of the large. And that was our biggest concern is we wanted to allow people to have the right to assemble and to protest. But we also wanted it to be peaceful. We didn't want the you know, mass rioting or looting that went along with some of these other cities that occurred on Friday and Saturday. So I won't lie, initially we were very scared about what was going to happen. We received some intel around 7.30 Saturday night that it was moving from the Discover Mills area to Lawrenceville. There was a group that came down to the square, but it never was organized. Saturday, we had, or Christian Sunday, we had another group that started at the Lawrenceville Lawn. They went to downtown square. They were disrupting traffic. Um, they had super soaker water guns and were spraying cars. Um, so they went from there to the police department. And that's about the time that I arrived here. Um, we were trying to keep them contained to let them stay on the sidewalk and that didn't really work. Um, we didn't know who the organizers were. We didn't have any conversations prior to this. It was more of a hostile crowd and blocking the road in front of the parking deck. Uh, I got sprayed down with my car did with a super soaker and then we had damage done to my car and three or four other police cars from um, rocks, people just hitting them. Um, I still don't know how what caused the damage on mine, but I heard a thud and looking at it the next morning saw a big dent in the trunk lid. That group um, more or less was not the type of peaceful protest we were looking for. Uh, we knew that come Monday there was another wing that was going to happen in front of City Hall and um, we were able to reach out to the organizer of it and i uh, spoke with him prior during that day uh, met with him prior to it we were able to coordinate and have a plan in place of shutting down clayton street there in front of city hall and uh, the mayor had enacted a 9 p.m curfew so Everything was able to be planned out. Um, we were able to have conversations. I was able to give my cell phone number to some of the organizers and keep in contact with them. Um, we had some a uh, few hiccups with it, but I couldn't ask for anything better come 845 when everybody started to leave. And then Tuesday, they had another one across from City Hall. Um, There's probably 150 people there up on the grassy knoll um, near City Hall. They marched down the sidewalk, did not get in the street, crossed over the lawn and came back, and we didn't have any problems with those as well. If I can back up a few years, this 
all starts back in 2016. Um, we had a peaceful protest on the Lawrenceville lawn. Um, a Grayson High School student had organized it. We found this out on a Friday. They were having it Saturday afternoon. I was able to find a cell phone number for him and uh, talk with him and everything went fine. Uh, this was in the height of Ferguson and the Baton Rouge incident. Uh, Freddie Gray as well. So I think the key is being able to have conversations with them as far as these protests go and being able to talk with the organizers, tell them what your expectations are and tell them that, you know, hey, we recognize your right for public assembly or your protest, but we want to keep some guidelines on it to make sure that everybody's safe on your end and everybody's safe on the law enforcement or the public side as well. Yeah. Um, with going back to the 2016, um, we coordinated three bridge of gap forums. Um, we had one at City Hall in 2016. 2017, we had one here at the police department. And then in 2018, we had one at Tabernacle Church off Simonton Road. Um, that was a very good one. We probably had about 150 people show up for it. I think they represent about 20 different countries with their congregants. So it was very good to have that diverse field there. Tell me a little bit more about that program. What we did is we had a moderator. Um, we had uh, Jeff, if I can't remember his last name, um, that used to be, help me out here, Mayor. Um, I can't remember the, the the moderator, but I know you had, you know, you had Judge Harris, you know, Rodney there. And, yeah. Um, the, uh, right. The first one, we had a panel and we had represented by African-Americans. Um, we had police officers on the panel. Um, the second one was a little bit more diverse where we had some high school students and the moderator would pose questions to each of the uh, participants in there. And we also allowed for the audience to pose questions as well. And pretty much same thing at the Tabernacle Church. It was also the same. Um, it had a more diverse group as well. I had some judges, um, some local authority figures, and being like a week into or maybe a month into being a new chief, there were a lot of questions for me as where I stood as far as moving the department forward and what my mission and my vision for the department was. Um, chief, it was Jeff Dickerson. Dickerson, I kept wanting to say Duncan, but yes, uh, Jeff Dickerson did the first one as moderator and Melvin Everson did the second moderator. Well, I, I, I was, uh, as a pastor in the community, I was out at the protest on Monday night, you know, just really being in prayer for people, being in prayer for the, the hurt and pain that um, so many of those protesters uh, were demonstrating and, and so many in the black community are feeling right now. Uh, so praying for the, the police officers who did such an incredible job of keeping everyone safe uh, and allowing them at the same time to uh, to express their their right to uh, assemble. Uh, and I just I, I thought it was a, a really well orchestrated um, effort on both sides. So do thank you and thank you to your officers. What what did you tell your officers before? Monday evening? Well, I mean, we, first and foremost, I want them to be safe and I want them to be able to go home to their families. That's the ultimate goal. Each and every day, every night they come to work is for them to go home safe to their families. Um, we started at 930 that morning with command staff developing a plan. I'd already had it mapped out pretty much in my head what I was wanting to shut down in areas I wanted to give. I didn't want a large police presence. I wanted the end of Clayton Street at Nash and Clayton at Seminary to have, you know, an officer presence, but I didn't want anything to be like we were overbearing or trying to stop them from having that. 
again, we had one hiccup in there where they pushed past the barricades at Clayton Seminary, and it kind of caused some concern for me and concern for the public safety. So all those officers, and it was a multi-jurisdictional effort from Gwinnett County Police, Gwinnett County Sheriff's Department, and all the municipalities here within Gwinnett County, um, but at that point, we had to bring out a little more reinforcements and kind of make sure that it stayed contained to that one area. Yeah. Very good. Very good. Well, thank you for your work on that. Uh, still, uh, why don't you talk to me about last week a little bit? What what was going through your head as you heard the, uh, the possibility of these protests and saw some of the news happening around the country? Why don't you walk me through that? So um, my, my role was a, a, obviously was a little different than the chief's. I, I let the chief uh, do his job. Um, and I, you know, and I have his back on, on that. I'm not a police officer. I have been pulled up over for speeding tickets o over the years, but not nothing late. That's about 15 years, I guess. But, um, but I would tell you that my role was to work with the community, to be on the phone. Um, I was on the phone with Chuck Warbington, our city manager. He was uh, that Sunday night. He was with the uh, with the chief, um, and trying to keep us a, a sense of what was going on to be able to relay that to um, the uh, the community. I was on the phone a lot with with the uh, senior um, black community, uh, trying to um, uh, ascertain, you know, so I could fill them in what was going on because just like with the white community. In the black community right now, the uh, you the older generation there's a generational gap between what's going on between the older uh, older generation and the younger generation. So, mm -hmm. no difference. Doesn't matter what your race is, it's all the same. Uh, so, so we were trying to in that case, my job was sort of bridge the gap, try to get the information over so that the community could know what the chief was trying to do, trying to uh, allow the protest to occur which um, was evident, we just sort of got the brunt of it um, uh, on Sunday because it was more the people from the information the chiefs, you know, been given. It wasn't a peaceful protest. It, it didn't start up on social media. It was all about um, uh, creating a riot as, as opposed to a, a peaceful protest. What I, uh, what the chief didn't share was that all these people on Saturday and Sunday are from other places. So they got lost in downtown Lawrenceville. It was not that big, but they, uh, they ended up at Dairy Queen. They didn't know how to get back. And so half went one way, half went another way. And so meanwhile, the chief is moderating that. And um, what was really neat about that I got to hear, I got a really neat letter from a, um, a woman whose uh, son is on the county police force. And he was there Saturday night and then Sunday night. And he watched the chief on Sunday night have to get out and tell some of the protesters to quit throwing rocks. And he walked out into the crowd and told them. And the young police officer on the county level was just amazed that the chief would be so engaged, go out there as an individual, not wearing a you know helmet and all that, just go out there and talk to him. And... Um, and that young officer was very appreciative. That county officer was very appreciative. And um, one thing is sort of neat that I learned from all this is how all the jurisdictions work together. So the chief alluded to it. All the all the uh, juris, uh, all the municipalities that have police forces, and the county and the sheriff, all work together to help in a crisis like this. Um, so that was. Um, I have to admit, I did not know that, um, but they all work well together, and and so they, so that was what was going on, you know, Sunday and Monday. Monday was like the, the chief had uh, been able to talk to the organizer, and that just made all the world in the I uh, made all the difference in the world, so that we really could have a peaceful protest. Those leaders, those young leaders, typically eighteen to twenty-five was the age group. Eighteen to twenty-one is the age of the leaders. They asked people like myself and uh, state representatives and, and others to and county representatives come and talk to the crowd. Um, and then with that, you know, it was around uh, 
we're, we're some are guessing around 700. So there we all are. You know, yeah, like the chief said, you know, at one point, what COVID 19, what? I mean, <laughs> you just totally had to forget about it because there we were, like sardines with 700 of my newest friends. And then we're having one on one, face on face um, discussions about, you know, the, the situation, what's occurring. Do we care? Um, what is Launchville's police force like? And and they were very, um, the young protesters were very appreciative that myself, that Chuck and others, and and that, you know, um, we had um, that Marlene, uh, Taylor Crawford was there, that Marlene Foscu was there. They were very appreciative to have those one-on-one -on -one dialogues and the chief being out there talking to them. And they got a better sense of what Lawrenceville is. Mm -hmm. um, and that they can count on us moving forward, not just to let them talk, but then to continue to work and to uh, make sure that we have a healthy community. So um, that was sort of my role was getting out there and then talking with them afterwards um, and to stay out of the chief's way. I think one of my phrases is, I want to help but not hinder. <laughs> so, you know, because, you know, people look at me as a, quote, politician, you know, and – I don't really care to be seen or be heard or whatever. I just want to do what is going to help the community. And so I laid back until I needed to come in, but I had no problem, you know, getting in there and, uh, and, and you know, encouraging the crowd. For instance, there was one point, uh, Reverend, that we had to uh, – the crowd thought we had – the chief had tear gas. And I had to say, no, no tear gas, no tear gas. We don't have say, tear say gas. Say that again, David, because uh, I think that's important. To, for we, here. The, the chief had no plans of having tear gas there. So he was afraid, you know, people were afraid that he was going to start shooting tear gas around, you know, at, at the curfew. The curfew was to keep those instigators that wanted to create a riot. That was to fix it so that then if once the peaceful protesters left at nine o'clock, um, then there was, there was nobody to get riled up about something. And then those guys left. And, uh, and they were out there. I mean, Chief's got a lot of intel of some really bad people were out there in that crowd uh, with the young protesters that had not a clue. And I don't know who they were, and I was just as glad I didn't know who they were. So, <laughs> so that's the Chief's job. So That's it. That's it. Well, I, I – you know, again, I, I was out, so I, I got to see the both of you engage and interact with uh, with our officers, with protesters, with community leaders. Um, what were some of the things that you learned uh, from these conversations last week? Chief, let's let's start with you, if you don't mind. Yes, sir. Um, Thursday, I had a meeting planned with three of the organizers um, here at the police department to kind of continue the discussion because we had told them on Monday night that we wanted to continue the discussion with them. Um, ended up having, instead of three, about 10 people show up. So um, we were, it was one on 10, but um, I tried to give them a little background and tried to educate them a little bit about police work and the Lawrenceville Police Department. Um, they have a lot of fears. They have fears that if they call 911, that someone's going to come to their house and they're going to get that one bad officer. Um, you know, I think we can all agree that 99% of all officers are good, but in every profession, there's going to be at least one bad apple. Mm -hmm. Doesn't matter if you're a preacher, teacher, uh, doctor, lawyer, whatever the case may be, there's going to be bad apples in every profession. Uh, law enforcement is not exempt from that. We do have some bad apples. Um, what we saw in Minneapolis was one person took action, and it's inconjurable to me that he did this, and three took inaction and stood around and watched. And it's also inconjurable to me that they just let it happen. But that's Minneapolis. That isn't the Lawrenceville Police Department. Um, one of the things that I've done in the last over two years as chief is I've tried to change the culture of this department. Um, there's accountability at all levels. A police department will reflect its leadership, just like a church, just like a city will as well. So I want my department to reflect what I am as a leader. 
I want to empower the officers to make decisions. I want them to be able to go out and do their jobs and do it with the support of the chief behind them. And that's what I tried to emphasize to these organizers. And, you know, it's not easy to sit there and have that conversation and be called a racist and told that you have white privilege. Or if you agree with Drew Brees about the American flag, then you're a racist or a white supremacist. And those are things that were said to me during that conversation. Mm -hmm. um, so it's there's a little bit of generational gap, as the mayor alluded to. This 18 to 21, 25 year, year olds are what I call a 9-11 generation, that they were born right around 9-11. Right. And for years, they've seen 24-hour news cycle that we didn't see growing up. So we had three or four channels on the TV. But now they have TV news 24 hours a day on several different channels. They have social media. And we know that the media, if it bleeds, it's going to lead. So they're going to run the story automatically. And oftentimes, they are biased against law enforcement. So... As much as what's happened throughout the country, um, I saw last night that 749 police officers have been injured since the uh, incident happened on Memorial Day, and we've had several that have been killed. Um, one in Las Vegas right now that's on life support from being shot in the back of the head. So there has to be an understanding that we're not robots. We're people. We have problems. We have good days and bad days as well. Um, but they need to understand that also that what they're seeing in other cities is not the culture we're building here in Lawrenceville. Right. We're taking on several national and state initiatives to better ourselves as a police department and to be better and diversify the department so it represents the community. My first year as chief, we had nine positions that we filled. Seven of those were diverse candidates. So. Um, it was kind of a changeover from the my predecessor and trying to make the department reflect the demographics of the community. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you for sharing all that. That's, that's, a, that's fantastic. Mayor Still, same, same idea. You, you had lots and lots of conversations uh, over the last week and a half. What are some of the things that you've learned uh, either about perceptions about the community or uh, about the African-American community here in Lawrenceville? Well, I guess one of the key things just recently I've learned in, um, we have, like the chief says, it's very diverse, but we have so many people that think they live in Lawrenceville and they don't. Um, so then you find yourself almost talking for the, the, the county, and we can't, so we have to really know the county um, well so that then we can at least have a general discussion and get it right for them. Because the, all, the, all our organizers, nobody's a citizen of Lawrenceville. I've gotten a lot of letters saying people um, are um, residents of Lawrenceville, and they, they are residents of the zip code, Lawrence. Um, mm -hmm. I, I, I did actually get to meet one or two on Monday night that were citizens of Lawrenceville, and they knew that. Many did not. Um, as Adam, I don't know if I've mentioned this to you, but I've had several people at First United Methodist Church say that they voted for me when I ran for city council. Well, um, I only I ran unopposed, so only nobody voted for me but me. <laughs> yeah, Vicky didn't even vote for me. So, you know, my wife. So, um, she, And so she might not have. She, that's right. That's right. Um, so it's an education. What I learned was it, helping everybody learn what our community is. Um, where, um, and, and, and so it's been sort of, uh, that part's been a little bit of um, a fun to get to know them. They want to be part of the Lawrenceville community. Well, okay, then you are. You're part of the community. You might not be a voting resident but you are part of our community that's what makes Lawrenceville great so so I really realized Lawrenceville's bigger than just our city limits you know and um so being engaged with all those people from Duluth from Grayson as, as the chief talked about you know in 2016 gentleman was from Grayson where did he where did he come to have his uh 
is protest, launch for you, you know, so s same thing here. Um, and, and so getting to help them know Launchville and then for me to really understand what our, our community is, is not just the citizens that, that, that vote here. Um, so I, uh, that's some of the, what I learned also I learned though was how much the uh, community wants to work together. So um, at least the people I'm working with, the, um, the leaders in the black community, they, they won't, they are trusting us to do the right thing. They've gotten to know us. We have engaged to know them, you know, cause I'm obviously not African American. Um, but it's, so we're, we're all working together to build a, a, a safe community. And this is um, to the chief's point, you know, no one really knows the Lawrenceville police that well as far as all their stats because we haven't had any issues. So there's no reason for people to have to ask these questions. So I've had to many times tell people, I don't know that answer. We haven't had any issues. So I don't know what our policy is on that, but we don't have any complaints. And we don't. So that's a good place to start. And I've had some, a great couple of emails with people saying, wow, that's really great to hear. I appreciate y'all working hard to try to help us understand because we want to make Lawrenceville, you know, a great place to live. And we appreciate y'all going towards that effort. So the chief's been really great at, at working to be transparent. He, you know, um, chief, why don't you tell a little bit, just real quick, not to uh, take over the, uh, <laughs> The program. You got it, David. It's all yours. But but talk about you know the the latest you know, some of hires you have with you know Myron and Tanya and how when you talk about diversity some of the first time ever in you know city of Lawrence what things sure I'd be glad to I mean it's going back to changing that culture year um, when I came in I brought in an African American assistant chief uh, Major Walker. Um, he is the first black supervisor that the city of Lawrenceville has ever had, and he's in a command staff position and serves as the assistant chief. Um, within a year, I made another change in an appointed position as captain. Um, captain Tanya Gilabani is the first female supervisor we've had, and she's appointed to a captain's position and is over our uniform division as well. Um, she's kind of that gap between me and the millennials and all that and kind of bridges that for us, especially in the uniform division, because we have, you know, kids that are in their 20s. I say kids, but they're in their 20s coming into work now. They're, you know, being born about the time I started doing my law enforcement career. So um, it's a challenge reaching out to them. Um, law enforcement in general has changed from a paramilitary organization to more contemporary style. Um, the old cop, you say, go climb that wall. They wouldn't ask you why or anything. They just go climb that wall and be standing there waiting on you. Today, they'll want to know why. Why do you want me to climb that wall? You know, is there something on the other side of that wall? How's it going to benefit me? So it's, you know, we have to have, be able to wear many coats as a leader. One style of leadership does not fit the officers of today as it did many years ago. So you have to wear those mini coats and deal with situational leadership is what I call it. Um, I think as a department, we've done a tremendous job of changing our culture. Um, officers have come forward when they've seen other officers do things that were unethical or immoral. And they have told their supervisors, they've told command staff, and we have ensured that discipline came down on those officers that violated our policies or procedures. So it's that understanding that each officer knows that if they see something that's not right, they're going to intervene or they're going to let their supervisors know about it and they're not going to sit there and have inaction on it. We continue to build, um, we're taking the one mind plan, one mind campaign with the International Association of Chief Police um, that ensures that 20% of our officers are trained in crisis intervention techniques and then 100% of the entire department to include sworn civilian dispatchers, everyone is trained in mental health first aid. So it's 
We've almost got that complete. Uh, we did the pledge about six months ago. We had 18 months to complete it, but we've almost got it complete now. Great, that's fantastic. Well, Chief, maybe uh, there's there seems to be this this false dichotomy being uh, set up between the police and the black community. Uh, what are some ways that we can be supportive of? of both of those communities of people and and what are some of the ways that we're bridging the gap i know you just shared a couple of us, uh just within the the police department here but uh maybe try to bring those two communities together a little bit for me well I, it started out i think you know having that conversation and understanding what their concerns are um and knowing that their concerns as an African-American are different than necessarily what happens with me being a Caucasian male. Uh, do I still get scared when I get pulled over? Of course I do. I got hands sticking up like this, so I make sure that if I've got a gun in the car, it's nowhere near it. So yes, I still get scared, but I can't understand what it's like for them when they get pulled over. And it's being able to empathize with them and understand that and, you know, I think that there has to be understanding and change on both parts um, to believe that all law enforcement is institutionalized racism is a false narrative. It couldn't be further from the truth. Um, last week, um, when the six officers in Atlanta got arrested, five of those were African-American and talking with these kids, they said, no, they're not black, they're blue. So they're categorizing them as all law enforcement is just blue. And that's further, couldn't be further from the truth because we are the same people. We leave, we put our pants the same way. We've got families, we've got children. Um, the only difference is, is we miss the holidays. We miss the ball games. We work shift work. It's times that you know, with the family that are interrupted. And I think that there needs to be a little bit of understanding on both sides that we are a profession. Law enforcement is constantly striving to improve and to become more professional in everything that we do. It's not the 1960s, 70s, 80s. This is a totally different profession. And we're a little bit behind. We've always lagged a little bit behind, but at the same time, we have to be open and transparent. Law enforcement in itself can sometimes be its worst enemy because we have a bunker mentality. If you're not a cop, you don't know our job and we're not gonna share it with you and I don't trust you to share it with you. So we have to be open and we have to start those conversations. We have programs, Citizens Police Academy, um, Pizza with Police, truck, Touch a Truck, um, a lot of events that we do and even the Bridge of Gap forums that I encourage these, I challenge these people to come out, interact with us, and see what we do and talk to us side by side, human to human. Law enforcement does not get called to your house on your best day. Normally they get called when you're having your worst day or something bad has happened or you've been in an accident. So we don't see people at their best. We oftentimes see them at their worst and it creates animosity for some people that hey, a cop's having to come here and nothing good is happening. So we need to be able to build relationships and we need to be able to see each other as all humans, we all bleed red and no matter what your skin color is. And, 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 and Reverend, I'll tell you that um, the chief is, you know, right now waiting. The the uh, uh, Hope Dennis was one of the uh, organizers. And in the newspaper article, she said, you know, what really needs to happen next is, you know, we need to get with the uh, senior leadership of the black community, with them, with the young organizers, and then they would come back to the chief. So I can tell you I did my part in getting that word out to the senior leadership of the black community. They've got the contact information, and so they will be getting back with, with the chief. And the chief had already met, I met with two young gentlemen back in January who wanted to 
have um, young black boys have a better um, a relationship with the police and trust them. So I talked to the chief. He immediately had a meeting with them, and they already have been uh, scheduled in uh, August, right, Chief? Isn't that that right? is correct, yes. And so that happened way before any of this. Then COVID hit. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. Right. yeah. <laughs> well, guys, talk to me about your hopes for the city of Lawrenceville, for our community, for uh, police, for the minority community, for the community at large. What are some of your hopes for this community? Chief, let me start with you. Well, I hope that the community will see the changes that are going on within the Lawrenceville Police Department. There's a lot of key terms that are thrown out there, police legitimacy, procedural justice, but I think procedural justice starts in the police department first in the way that the culture of the police department is. And number one, the officers have a voice. We respect them. They're neutral and we're transparent. And that is transformed over into the community as organizational justice and the way that we perform our duties each and every day. So it's incumbent on us to do that here first at the police department and then transform it over into the community. If we're not doing it here and we're not holding people accountable and we're not transparent, then there's, we're not being serving ourselves as justice towards the community as well. Um, I would like to see, you know, again, I'll touch back that when we have these opportunities for interaction with the police, I'd like to see a lot bigger turnout. Um, it's, you know, again, we can be our worst enemy, but on those events that we have, there's not always the turnout of people that come out. So, um, it starts at a young age. Um, I can't tell you how many times in my career I've been in a restaurant and a parent tell their child, if you misbehave, he's going to lock you up. I mean, that, is that what you want to teach your kid that the police is not your friend and I'm going to lock him up if he misbehaves? No, you want the child to be able to trust you and to be able to look at you as a figure that, hey, if I need him, he's going to come running. And the same thing I told that group of 10 Thursday, I said, there's not a one of you inside this room right now that if we walk outside this building and somebody started shooting, that I would not lay my life down for each and every one of you. It's an oath I took. It's an oath I took seriously. I'm passionate about police work in general, and I'm very passionate about the, being the leader of this police department and moving forward into more contemporary style of policing. Fantastic. Mayor Steele, how about you? What are, what are some of your hopes for this community? Well, I would like to see it truly be a, um, be a community um, where we, are, we have um, a large population that's black, white, African, I mean, um, Hispanic or, you know, Latino, um, Asian, Bosnian, Romanian, we have got quite the diversity here, and I want them all engaged um, with our government, with, um, with the community, um, coming out to our events, uh, being a part of the various uh, committees we have and boards to, that we, where we need community, community input. We only had 700 people vote in the last election hmm. out of 30,000 citizens. That's not much engagement. Um, and so we, we, we've got to find a way to get people, uh, engaged so that they feel Lawrenceville and they, uh, they appreciate Lawrenceville for, for what it is and what it can be. I, and it, it can only get, it can only get better. I'm, I've, I feel confident in its future. Um, and I'm, uh, I'm, I'm grateful to be a part of it. I did not know, I'll admit I did not know how well thought of the Lawrenceville Police Force was throughout the state of Georgia until I got involved in city council. And then I started finding out how many people wanted to go work for it um, and, uh, and, and, and how well respected it was. And I mean, our chief is the president of the uh, county um, organization for chief of police. Um, so 
uh, we're um, well thought of, and I want to I want to help it keep that way. And you know, the the, the chief is pushing to make a police uh, a department not a police force, but a, a a part you know really part of the community that is helping with the uh, the, the mental illness issues we have. We have a lot of um, situations that you know they put they have to deal with those that are mentally ill mm -hmm. from our homeless camps to those that you know were at the various viewpoint homes that are in our area and you know that's a, a state agency and if those you know individuals forget to take their meds that day they end up sitting on the edge of the sidewalk you know and, and chief has to go deal with them and talk talk them through we had a police officer, Chief, wasn't it just last year, one of your officers talked to a gentleman off, jumping off the bridge at uh, 316 and one That's correct, yes. I mean, and he knew, he was trained how to do it, and he saved that gift of life that that guy had been given by God. And that's the type of police force you got. Yeah, yeah. Fantastic. Good luck. So my hope is, is that people can see it, and once they start owning the city, then, it went, then it's, it'll be their city and we'll all, and everybody won't quit pointing fingers because they're part of the problem. <laughs> We're all and the part. solution. And the solution, right, right, right. Yeah. Well, guys, uh, one last question, if, if you don't mind. Um, you know, I, I pastor a church. I, I talk to a lot of other pastors throughout our community. Uh, I talk to a lot of uh, church people. How can the church be supportive of the city, of the police department, of our community as a whole, um, anything that we can do? Chief, let me, let me start with you there. Well, I think the values of the church are very important. Um, it also goes along with family values, and um, I think we see a lot of families that are broken, and I think the church is a very good opportunity for them to get involved with and that's going to take some reaching out to <clears throat> excuse me but the some of these youth aren't church goers they um, aren't interested in it and when you bring up the faith leadership to them they're not interested in having faith leaders participate mm -hmm. in these conversations they want much higher they want people that are on legislative levels that can make decisions on whether marijuana is legal or illegal or make some criminal justice reforms. So it's going to be hard work gaining their trust as well, unless they're already involved in it. So I think the pastors, the assistant pastors, um, growing up, I went to church four times a week. So it's getting them involved and starting that same conversation with them. Mm -hmm. um, Faith-based leaders have an obligation to God, to their communities, that they have taken an oath, much like law enforcement, that you're going to go out and you're going to preach God's word. Um, it may be a different word to some of these other tool or people that are involved in these protests, but there has to be some outreach towards them. And I don't know if that's done as a collective group, um, bringing in African-American pastors, along with Caucasian pastors, Romanian pastors. I've had outreach from all of them. And like the mayor alluded to, we have a couple here that are wanting to work with them. And I think if we can ever get that collective group together and kind of voice some of the concerns and have a representation from all sides of the playing field, it will be a tremendous effort on all of us. I love it. Uh, Mayor Still, there's there's no pressure because your your preacher is asking you the question, but uh, what 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 can the faith community do to help this city? Well, you know, people in in general they need to know um, people like to be a part of something that's bigger than themselves. And um, one thing the church does is it teaches the value that they are as an individual that God created. It's a gift God gave them. And once they can realize how special they are, they'll want to be a part of the community. They'll want to be a part of the church. They, if they know they're just not a number 
it's that dialogue, it's having a relationship, it's caring for somebody. It's amazing, you know, when you rem- just like okay, as a pastor, if you could, you know, just remembering somebody's name, how special that is. To I can't tell over the years how special it is. Well, the pastor remembered my name. I mean, you know, it's a big deal, and it's a lot of pressure on y'all because I'm not really good with names. But uh, <laughs> but I think. Um, with being engaged and have, helping people have relationships with each other that are meaningful, where, you know, that you care, you truly care for each other, and you don't mind getting into the messiness of life, I think that's where pastors can help make people feel, have self-worth, feel that they're a part of the world that God created, and they don't have to just count on themselves, um, you know, because that would be such a scary place for me to think, that if I thought that what I, the, um, the responsibilities I have as a mayor is much larger than what, who I am. And I have to have, in my situation, I have to have Christ to give me that strong foundation. So we need to help people to be able to stand firmly on a solid rock as opposed to sifting sand. And so, so if y'all can help people understand what a special gift they are, to their creator, then we'll have a much better community. I love it. I love it. Well, guys, thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much for the way you serve our city. Uh, I really, I'm proud to be a part of this community. Last week uh, during the protest, you guys just really, you really know who you really are as people in terms of your willingness to be engaged and, and to work with people, to have conversations. And so, uh, Thank you from me, just as an outside observer. Uh, thank you for what you do. Thank you for what you did, and thank you for what I know that you are continuing to do. Um, you know, I, I'm just uh, I'm so grateful for for both of you and for uh, all of our city leaders, our, our police officers. Um, they really do a phenomenal job, and so uh, it's great to be a part of Lawrenceville right now. Any any final thoughts from either of you? Anything you want to say to uh, anybody out there? We just look forward to working with everyone. And if you need us, call us. We're here to protect and serve. That's right. I couldn't have said it better. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, this has been the Help Desk uh, with Chief Wallace and Mayor Still here in Lawrenceville. Hope you guys have a great day, and I hope this was helpful. <laughs>